really loud back there. There's all sorts of uh, sounds from that waterfall and other pipes and filters and all sorts of things behind the scenes. So, did everyone have their after lunch coffee? Yep. Yeah, you did. We have a birthday boy here with a stuffed penguin. Someone's a big fan. So we all want to have the same energy that you have here, Juan. So on the count of three, we all want to have, with lots of energy, we want to shout, let's feed the penguins as loud as we can at the top of our lungs so that they know it's time to come out and start the feeding. Can you all do that? Okay, okay, I'll go with that. On the count of three, let's feed the penguins. One, two, three. Let's feed the penguins. So let's keep you, oh, I see a door over there. Great job, everybody. Hello, Allison. I heard a soft roar back here. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a loud roar out here. These folks are really excited. Oh, my goodness. You have a lot of penguin fans out there. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. We look like a little escapee escape there. Escapee, uh, Sikoe. So those of you that can't see what's going on, Shauna is still coming out. <laughs> She's trying to gently d er, uh, nudge Sikoe, one of our more social, friendly greeter penguins, <laughs> aside. And now I think most of you can probably see her. Hi, everyone. <laughs> hi. We say hi. <laughs> So it looks like you've got not just you in the exhibit and not just a feeder. Can you introduce what's going on uh, and who else is in the exhibit with you? Sure. Aside from all the birds, uh, the humans are as follows. <laughs> the popular one over there with the big bucket of food is Mika. Uh, Mika and Amy here in the middle are both aviculturists, uh, which means that they take care of a variety of the birds here at the aquarium. Amika's feeding, as I mentioned, and Amy has a very important role as well. She's recording exactly how many fish each and every one of these penguins is eating this afternoon. So why is that something that we would want to do? Why is that uh, count necessary? Well, it's the best way to monitor the health of each and every penguin. They are animals, so they don't overtly show signs of injury or illness. And when an animal has some sort of a noticeable change in their dietary habits, it's usually an indicator that something could be wrong or something's changing. For example, if a penguin is eating less, that could mean that that penguin needs to take a little visit to our staff veterinarian, Dr. Mike. And if the penguin is eating significantly more, that could mean that it is preparing to molt, which is, of course, the process of losing all of their feathers at once. Yeah, regrowing them in a really short amount of time. Yes. So, we, we're recording how many each penguin eats, but Shauna, they all look black and white to us. How on earth is Mika telling each penguin from the next? Well, when you spend a lot of time with these penguins, it's very easy to figure out who's who based on their little personalities or their little penguinalities. They, they all have uh, very unique little personas. But also you can look at their bellies and you can see that they have different spot patterns that are unique to each penguin, almost as if, uh, well, you could compare it to our fingerprints and how those are unique to each human being. And some of them have more noticeable spot patterns than others. Some have big black blobs on their necks, a cluster of dark feathers. So that makes them easier to pick out. And then, of course, we've got Walvis, who's over here, who's very easy to pick out. She's heading over to the far left. Looks like she's got a mohawk. Now, <laughs> she's a little scruffy because she's just at the end of the molting phase. They drop their feathers from the bottom up. But if uh, you're in doubt, there's a way to cheat. Real easy way to tell who's who. Allison? Uh, you can read the name tags. <laughs> so the people, like Shauna said, that work really closely with them don't need those name tags to read them. But for all of us who just have five minutes here, we can tell each of these penguins apart by the band that's on their right wing. The black band is the female penguins, or are the pe female penguins, and the white band are the male penguins. So we've got some interesting names in here. All right, Shauna, well, I did promise some folks out here that they could ask you some questions. Sure. All right, so does anyone have any questions for Shauna? And I'm going to... Call the per birthday boy first, right here. What are the penguins eating? Okay, what are the penguins eating today? What's for lunch? Oh, that's a great question. Well, from uh, this perspective, and I'm sure from yours, it looks comparable to an anchovy, but it's not. It's something called capelin, which is a type of smelt. Doesn't sound too great yeah. to us, but mm. they like it. That's their uh, their primary diet here at the aquarium. Although it's not what they would be eating in the wild. These are African black-footed penguins, and out in the open ocean, they eat something called a cape anchovy as a, um, their primary source of food. But we would not feed them cape anchovies here for a couple of reasons. Allison, would you like to share what those reasons are? Definitely. In the wild, these birds are from the coast of South Africa and Namibia. So that cape anchovy is found off the coast of South Africa. 
which means it'd be not very sustainable to transfer that fish all the way up here to California to feed these birds. It's also a very highly overfished type of fish, so we really want to leave the Cape anchovy down in South Africa for those wild penguins. The other reason is simply that it's really high in fat content, and these birds are exhibit birds. They're not exerting as much energy as their wild counterparts in order to get the food that they need. So this is a much better exhibit diet. It's a little low-fat diet for these birds. That's right, absolutely. It may actually mean all of our animals here are sustainable seafood. We don't want to harm the ocean in feeding all of our animals here. And if all of you would like to do something to contribute to healthy oceans as well, please feel free to pick up one of our Seafood Watch Pocket Guides, which Allison is holding right there. That is a wonderful tool. We've done all the work for you. If you love to eat tuna, but you get very confused by all the info about tuna as to what's good, what's bad, what's not sustainable, don't worry about it. Just pick up one of these cards and follow along. The red list, fish that need a break. The green list, good to go. Yellow, use caution. Very simple to read. And as consumers, we truly do drive the marketplace. So it's our wallets that makes a significant difference, as it has in the past. Swordfish is a great example. So please pick up one of these tools if you like to eat seafood. Yeah, we're all going to eat as well as our penguins pretty soon. Absolutely. All right, well, back to penguins. There's a big question in the back here. Do you mind shopping it? Okay, so what is the difference between these African black-footed penguins and, for example, the penguins in the Antarctic or however many species of penguins there are out there? Oh, great question. Well, there are 17 different species of penguin. Only five live in the snow and ice. So a lot of them live in warmer climates as well. So if you look at the emperor penguin that's about oh, four and a half feet tall, can weigh up to 100 pounds, that penguin's pretty well insulated in terms of uh, adipose tissue and densely packed feathers in order to stay warm in a very cold habitat. Those penguins live down in Antarctica. But these penguins from South Africa, along with some of their other penguin kin, such as South American penguins, the Magellanic penguins, or the penguins that live in the Galapagos Islands, they're not going to be uh, built the same way as the emperor penguin. As, uh, they're obviously very comfortable in this 50 degree water here, but not so much so in colder climates down in the, the southern hemisphere further. Yeah, so a lot of penguins, they all live south of that equator, but a lot of them live at much warmer temperatures. Any other questions for Shauna? Over here, what's your question? How many fish does the average penguin eat? Ah, that varies. On average, about 10 to 15 fish per day. And um, if the penguin is going to be molting, which we talked a little bit about that earlier, we looked at Walvis, who's just finishing, she's right there eating. Uh, then they can be eating anywhere from 40 to 50 fish a day, and that's to uh, bulk up and develop a lot of insulating fatty tissue since they'll have no feathers and they won't be getting into the water and they'll need to stay warm. That 50 fish a day is equivalent to about 14% of their body weight, so that's like some of you kids out there eating about 50 hamburgers in one day. <laughs> so these penguins in the wild, when they're working hard, they eat a lot. Absolutely. I think we have time for one more okay, question. Okay, one final question. How about you, sir? That's an awesome question. He's asking about the coloration, the black and white. Does that have anything to do with the confusing the animals that prey on them, or it's simply why are they the color that they are? Absolutely, and that's a, a great question. And yes, number one, it is for the purposes of confusing predators. So if you are, um, you know, a leopard seal, let's just pick a leopard seal, and you're swimming below a penguin and you look up, that penguin's white belly blends in with the sun. Now, you won't be as likely to see that penguin. If you reverse those roles and you're a leopard seal and you see a penguin swimming below you, the black backs, it blends in with the murky depths of the ocean. That's called countershading. You see a lot of that in many other species of animals. And also it helps the penguin to thermoregulate. If penguin is hot, then they can expose their white bellies to the sun, uh, to the air, to the cool air, cool down a little bit. If a penguin is a little bit cold, they can expose their black backs to the sun and uh, therefore warm themselves up because black absorbs heat. Yeah, that counter shading is an adaptation you'll find, as Shauna mentioned, in a lot of ocean animals for that camouflage from predators. But you'll also see it in top predators, like great white sharks with those gray backs and the white belly, or orcas. And that's because those predators, they don't have to worry about uh, anyone else, but it's also a good aspect for an element of surprise. 
That's so you'll see the true. coloration in a lot of ocean animals. Yep. Well, everyone, Shauna and all these uh, feeders work really hard for our birds. If we could give them a round of applause. Thank you so much, Shauna, for answering all of our questions. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for coming to meet our beautiful birds. And thank you, Allison, for filling all the wonderful questions. Of course. If any of you, or the rest of you folks, have any other questions, I'm happy to stay up here. I'll answer those questions for you off microphone. And otherwise, have a wonderful visit here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium.